Good evening, Gilles. Hey, Grindelie. <laughs> Hi. Good morning. Good morning to you. It's evening time for me, and I am so happy that you are joining us today. Um, it. Sorry. Can no, you... it's okay. It's a phone. It, it, I'm just going to unplug the phone for sure. <laughs> well, welcome, folks. We are with the one and only Gilles Apap, um, not to be matched and, and raw and honest and generous tonight in his willingness to talk to us about Mozart's cadenzas, something for which he is very well known. This is the third seminar of the National Concert Hall's International Master Course. Gilles, if you allow me, I would like to let the audience know a little bit about your biography. So, you were described by Yehudi Menuhin as the instance of the 21st century musician. Gilles, you're known for your virtuosity, your unique approach to music and the skill and joy that you bring to every performance in concert halls around the world. You deliver distinctive performances of standard classical repertoire combined with genres such as jazz and folk from around the world. And the result is unique programming merging the borderlines between musical styles. You've appeared just about everywhere, including the Concert House in Berlin, Bozart in Brussels, Cadogan Hall in London, the Philharmonie, the Philharmonie de Paris, uh, you've appeared in Tokyo, in Adelaide, in Switzerland, Italy, in Rheingau, Ludwigsburg, Dresden, and Würzburg. I'm getting all my languages mixed up. <laughs> <laughs> you don't catch it. And you have led workshops and educational projects across Europe, including at the Menuhin Academy in Gstaad, the Kronberg Academy, and the Paris Philharmonie, working with children as well as young professionals. Now, before we start getting going, Jeannie, I would like to let those watching currently through the general public viewing live streams, which you can find at the YouTube and Facebook channels of the National Concert Hall, please do submit any questions you have at this time that are relevant to this conversation, folks. This is a rare chance to find out how Gilles puts his Mozart cadenzas together. And there will also be questions from currently active participants on this call. But first of all, Jean, you are obviously a hugely well-known violinist. But moreover, you're also hugely well-known for your incredibly innovative and engaging, I would dare say charismatic interpretations of Mozart cadenzas, which are hugely original. Now for all of those who aren't aware of it, which would surprise me, but get yourselves aware because with a very simple search online, you will find any combination of Gilles' name and Mozart cadenzas, and you will find some amazing things. One of them uh, is the third Mozart concerto, the KV216. And I have to say, um, I tuned into those performances around 10 years ago, I became aware of a documentary that was made about you where you traveled to India to study local folk music. I also know that you have a huge, and we've also learned this from you, your master classes yesterday, that you have a huge love uh, and fascination with Irish traditional music, which is very apt uh, for this particular master course, which is um, geared towards uh, Irish uh, talent and Irish audiences. Um, and I know that you have a huge vocabulary in folk music with traditional styles from across the world and jazz as well. And you were the first person that I recall having seen not just playing and singing, but playing and whistling. And that in what could be deemed as a typically conservative, sorry folks, or shall we say more traditional setting in a typical concert hall. And there you were looking beautifully dressed in your green suit. Um, and with the expressions of orchestral players behind you, some of which were clearly enjoying their fun day out with you and really in it, and some who were sort of surprised and amazed and wondering how this was possible because you really broke through a lot of barriers with these kind of interpretations. So I'd like to talk about many things with you today, but one of them is the bravery that you have taken to kind of go through barriers and boundaries that we understand in classical music and 
Also today, I'd like to talk to you about how you do it and what advice you would give for musicians at home, for students and adult learners. How can we find skills and tools to create our own cadences? So let's start with the first question, which would be, where does the bravery come from? Um, do you even see it as bravery to, to sort of cross these lines of genre and to simply just, just use all the musical tools you have? Well, uh, it just, it, I don't know if, I, I can see myself on the screen, but um, I'm sure everybody can see me, right? We can see you wonderfully. Okay, cool. yeah. all right, great. Um, oh, uh, it's, it's just out of a game, you know, simply that's what it was. And, uh, it was, you know, I was coming back from the, from the road and I was heavily on the road at the time and just coming back home, which is in California, which is, you know, pretty far from Europe. And I was going home for two weeks. And, you know, those two weeks have to be as long as you can, you know. I mean, like a day is just going so slow. And during that period of two weeks, and everything is so slow, you just end up being into a music mode because you, you're home and relaxed, basically. And you're happy to be here. You know, you've been surfing. You've been doing a lot of things. You're back home, you know, listening to your birds, looking at the ocean. I mean, the whole thing is pretty organic around here. And so uh, everything is good for creativity, you know, in the sense, you know, because your mind is feeling at peace and you're relaxed and you're just around wood. And I remember one one evening just out of uh, out of nowhere you know i was playing a little jig yeah and or it's just uh even like a something simple so i was going like to So I was going through these kind of bowings, you know, trying to understand how the bow works in Irish style, or it could be anything, you know, because you said that I, was, I like Irish music. I do like Irish music very much, but I like other styles of music, like simple music sometimes, like socially unbelievable music to play, which is called old timey music. Everybody who starts to play the violin after two months or three months can play your tune. You know, it could be something really simple. So I was in this really simple mood of playing tunes for myself as pure enjoyment, you know, like, like something like this. In, a, in this kind of a mood where everything was pretty simple and pretty good and and so 
and I had to play. I had to play that Mozart concerto, like you know, for the next two or. And I, I just simply started to, you know, play around. You know, this uh, at the time was the G major. Oh yeah, right. That's what I was doing. I was trying to. I, just to see what kind of a chord he was using, so I whistled, you know, and... So that's it. That's fun. That's funny. That's fun. You know, I mean, there's nothing magical about it. It's just like whistling the tunes and doing little chords to it, you know. And then, and then the, the other part, the B part, I call it the B part, right? Uh, for the audience, you know, it's to make them a little more involved this in what I was doing. So this is the theme. Yim, pim, pim, pim. So I was trying to, yeah, no, so I was trying to make that in Irish style, just as a pure, you know, game. That's all it was, you know. But I changed the key because it, it's not really comfortable in a D major, and, and it has to be in first position. Yeah, like this. I don't know if you can see my fingers here. Can you? Yeah. The first thing that I started on a really simple jig like this, and I go, Oh, that's funny, but you know, with ab absolutely no conceptions of what was going on, you know. Um, and so from there, I was going to, Oh, yeah, this little theme goes. Hey, <laughs> what is really interesting uh, you know as a classical musician because this is what I do I play classical music it's our but I by changing the, the bow a little bit you get a different Starting to expand a little bit about, you know, what can you do with the, this little swing? Because I like swing music too. I like to play all these 
kind of music. I'm not an expert at it, but I, I love the music so much. And I think it's so interesting for classical uh, musicians to uh, try to understand because there is so many little things in the bow arm and and more you more you discover more you think about it more you uh, um, try to understand the um, the little secrets into it and more it leads you to something you know different and and then more and more you, you, you your world just gets a little bigger you know by by simply talking to people by traveling so i did this I, I started to incorporate all these trips that i used to take into the music basically that's what it was and and then uh yeah and then you know ah oh, what else can i do you know going to romania going to india and all this music just bring me back to the places where I was, which is for me, there was almost like little secret garden, you know, and hello. Yeah. Uh, but it's good place where you meet good people and you're happy, you know, to meet them and to play music with them. And so I did this little thing just for myself, you know, as a little game, you know, and, um, and then finally, once I had it all together, which took quite a long time, you know, because I've never thought I should do that in concert, never. Okay. No, no, because because uh, uh, I felt like comfortable doing it, you know, simply. Uh, it takes, uh, like you said, it, ah, it, it it reminds me of not not a not it was not a good time at all you know uh, it was not really a good time at all and uh, I must say I, I was shocked as probably as shocked as the audience was that I was shocked myself how you know the music that you play sometimes can. Oh, I learned so much about it. As you go on stage and, you know, we're talking like 25 years ago, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the first time that I've done it. So once I had all that all put together, and then I don't need to really much not to talk about that so much. I think the most important thing in, in this cadence uh, was the suffering that went with it because it was not fun at all. It wasn't uh, fun to play or you weren't, you, were, you, you didn't enjoy playing it or you didn't, or you were fearful of having uh, it? Well, Gwendolyn, that was really a, a funny time for me because I was, uh, okay, I did a documentary with uh, Mr. Bruno Mont-Saint-Jean, you know, he, this guy is really well. He was, he made movies with Yehudi Menuhin, Menuhin with Glenn Gould and with all this, Richter with this great guy. And, and I was like, you know, what does he want from me? You know, what does this guy want from me? Because I won a prize and I've never done competition in my life. I wanted to meet Mr. Menuhin and Mr. And, and Menuhin gave me a prize because I could play these Bartok sonatas by heart and I love them, you know. And, and I've never done competition in my entire life. So I was in my own world in California, just doing absolutely nothing, just playing soccer every day and just, you know, concert master in a little orchestra. So life was pretty simple. All of a sudden, a friend of mine told me, you know, I take a lot of detour, but just to make, you know, make you aware of what was going on. Yeah. A friend of mine called me, said, I'm going to, to do a trekking in the Himalayas. I go, okay, well, I, dude, I don't have any money and just pay a trek. I, I'm just going to charge it on the credit card. <laughs> right. And who cares? You know, it's, you pay whatever you want when you have money, you know, later on. So that was all right. 
we went to the Himalayas and I remember finishing the documentary and all that stuff, telling my friends, I think I'm going to be on TV. I think I'm going to be on TV. Like, and, and we were like 6,000 feet high in the Himalayas, you know, we were tr trekking big time, you know. Whew, no money, just a backpack and a fiddle. And we brought the fiddle all the way up there, you know, playing in refuge and stuff. Oh, it was great. It was like the great time. Coming back from that trip, I told my friend, I said, ah, listen, it's funny because I think I have a, I have a movie going on an Arte channel, you know, which is like, you know, the big channel at eight o'clock. And, and my friends go, oh, don't worry. I said, no, I'm not worried. I'm, I wonder what it's going to be like. Came back to Los Angeles. And I received so many letters from people about this documentary. So all of a sudden, I was little known because of this documentary on national TV. And I live really simply. I didn't have any kind of a goal about careers and stuff. I never believed it. And plus, I'm not comfortable going on stage and playing concert. And then from there, all this media thing just came in the way. Recording contracts, EMI, big contracts. I refused it. Sony Classical in New York, Peter Gelf, Columbia Artist Management, Yonoma, the all these things, which was for me just too much. It's just, just too much. Oh, well, so I came home and I... All right. And then that's where I was starting to go on the road. And that's where I started experiencing things with music a little more. And that's where, you know, so all of a sudden it was a different world. And then, you know, and you've known because you've been on TV. So I remember Mr. Menuhin calling me. Okay. Wow. Oh my God. Mr. Menuhin is like my... God, he's calling me. What do you want from me? Damn. It's like so cool. I mean, let's just listen to the violin concerto played by Mr. Menuhin when I was nine years old. Thank to my beautiful mother. She's great. And she put this LP of Mr. Menuhin playing the Beethoven violin concerto. And I was like, oh my God, this is so beautiful. And when you're a kid, things like this just stays in you. You know what I mean? It just doesn't go away. It stays, you know, because it's pure. Mm -hmm. And the beauty of it uh, was when, because that's the first concert I went to see. That's the first time I've seen Mr. Menuhin live. That's the first time I, I had to put this damn tie on. And when you're a kid, you don't understand why you have to put a tie on. I mean, nothing makes sense, you know. My brothers used to make fun of me. Hey, man, you look up with a tie on. I said, mm, shut up. Let's go to the counter. My first autograph from Mr. Menuhin when I was, you know, okay. So everything was like, good. Mr. Menuhin calls me. Okay. All of a sudden, you're like floating high. I said, oh, all right. And it was six o'clock in the morning. I could not even like believe, you know, I was sl sleeping in like you know, 12 square meters under a tree in California. And, you know, my brothers were visiting me and we were just like, hey, there's a guy calling you by the name of, you know, Yehudi Menuhin thinks he's Yehudi Menuhin. I said, what's going on, man? Hang up on him. And Mr. Menuhin called again. <laughs> and it's just, oh, it's crazy. It was just like, what, what's going on? All right. So that was a little thing knowing that you know Mr. Minhin was interested in what I was doing. And then I was playing a concert in Cannes. Uh, so by that time people know who you are, you see? And then you go and play something, you get something in the paper, you get, you know, advertising and stuff. And I played at five o'clock in the Palais des Festivals à Cannes. 2,000 people. It was totally sold out. And Mr. Menuhin was playing in Cannes. 
with his own orchestra. At the same time, how stupid, I was, you know, playing at five o'clock. He was playing in a different place outside of Cannes, and I was playing in Cannes. So he was there the night before, okay? And then I'm thinking, and he called me up and he goes, okay, Gilles, uh, all right, let's do it. Let's get together. Okay, I said, all right, great. And I went to see him in Cannes the night before the concert happened. And that's where all, everything began because of this gentleman. All my trouble began because of him. I don't want to give me, but he said, Gilles, I heard that you have a cadenza of this Mozart concerto, and I'd love to hear it, you know. I said, oh, oh, yes, sure. Yes, sir. <laughs> it's like, well, it's nothing, you know, it's just something fun. I have to play the concerto tomorrow, but I'm not playing the cadenza because I, I'm i not in the mood. You see, I, it's too much. It's too disturbing even for me to do it. He said, Gilles, you have to do it. Uh, and uh, so in a way, you're so in love with this gentleman. I was, you know, and, and spent time with him as one-on-one. -on -one. There was nobody around. And we spent a lot of time talking about music, talking about life, talking about things. And he was really interested in what I was doing. And... Um, yeah, and then he said, you have to do it. You have to play it in concert tomorrow. I said, okay. Uh, what should I... I, I said, I, I didn't tell the, the conductor that I was doing it. The orchestra doesn't know what I'm going to do. I, I cannot do it, sir. I mean, and he said, well, think about it, you know. This is your chance to do it. You need to do it. Okay, easy for him to say, right? Okay, I was not even sure about what I was doing. Like I said, it was just a game, you know. And then when I went on stage and I told, you know, dress rehearsal, I told the conductor, I said, I might do something really different tonight, you know, for the concert. He goes, what are you going to do? And, you know, they get all excited. Oh, don't do anything funny. And I said, no, oh, well, uh, well, listen, sir, I've met Mr. Minuhin and he told me, and the, the conductor was just a wreck, you know, you know. I said, let me do it. I take responsibility and I'll go on stage and do it. The only cue that you have to remember is the Mendelssohn Violin Concerto and at the end of it. And that would be your cue and you'll be really clear. All right. Okay, so go on stage, play the play the Mozart violin concerto for the first time. You have all your families there because I, live, you know, I grew up in Nice and you all families there, your father, mother, friends, and everybody, everybody. And, and then, you know, as you ended up playing the, the concerto at the beginning and then for the old concerto, you have to think about this cat inside, you've never done, you see. And so, Okay, first movement is finished. Second movement is finished. And then you, your throat is getting, you know, a little drier and everything is just, you know, you don't know how you're going to react, you see? You, you don't know you, your music well enough to, to, uh, oh, to do it in public. And that, that was the worst thing in my life. Because um, I've done it. Yes. Uh, I... I started doing that and I started pe people <coughs> coughing and you know older people you see uh, and then uh, and then that's it and that's where the nightmare began and everything went down the drain and uh, and so and then you know I I was playing the blues <laughs> Uh, it was just crazy and then people started yelling clapping whistling 
calling call 911 is crazy is insane and they they used to yell at me and and and, and pain in my stomach i had my some of my friends right in front of me trying to say Gil, go go finish it man finish what you're doing okay so i i just finished and and then mozart goes to romania but everybody is so confused about everything it's just big mess and 2000 people it was big it was and i went and finished it people didn't even clap people whistle people booed you know and when you're being booed on stage that's not a good thing you know that's not a good thing it's it was it was a pain in my stomach i went backstage and I, I just basically like went along the uh, the walls, you know, to my dressing room. Nobody was talking to me. All the musicians, no one talked to me. No one went and said, Gia, thanks, you know. Gia, thank you. Uh, oh, that was interesting. Nothing. No comments. My father, who I love very, very much, is a little guy now is 90 years old you know my mother is like this they, they, you know they look like a salt and paper shakers you know they all rest together and and it's very conventional i love my dad but out of insecurities you know i said hey my son i'm ashamed of you i mean all my friends you know what are they gonna think you know i said sure, fuck i'm fucked sorry i say fuck <sighs> And life has to move on and say so you wake up the day after with a pain in your stomach and something that that you think was right went all wrong. And that's the story of how we began. And that was not good at all. But like you said, you know, you took the you took the, the you had the courage to do it. You had to courage to go on stage and try something because now you know when you go on the road everybody goes oh yeah this go you can dance oh you mother can dance I go okay right. and for years and years uh two years I haven't played it three years I haven't played that can dance until Mr. Menuhin called me back and he said we have to do a movie on it and and he died four days before we did the shooting. And so what you see on YouTube is um, me conducting. I've never even conducted an orchestra. I was, you know, and Mr. Saint-Jean Bruno did a, did a movie about it. And that's, that's it. That was the beginning. And then somebody just put it on YouTube. And then, you know, since I don't never have internet and TV here, you know, people used to call me from Iceland, from different places, and that's how it all started. And say, but they don't realize how difficult it is to do that. You know, they always think so simple. You know, but it's not simple at all. I need it gave me a lot of suffering, and every time, you know, once in a while, I would have like a remembrance of this feeling. You know, down in my stomach. And that's that's the truth. I'm not making. I'm just telling you things the way they are, simply because I, you know, people drive me nuts, and they not drive me nuts. Whatever they, you know, if they give them a little inspirations to do things, so that's good. But it was a little difficult. I understand, and very very grateful that you've shared this story with us. Um, mm. It was very intimate and and uh, I really thank you. Can I ask mm. you how did you start finding a love for for music outside of the classical genre? Because I mean you grew up with classical music. Yeah. And when did you start? When do you recall when you first got in touch with with folk music or jazz music or uh, any of the music that you've cited actually so far in talking with me with us? Well, you know, yesterday we talked about it. Like, I was here in California, you know, and, and uh, coming to school, I've never been to school. I was really bad in school. They threw me out of school when I was 13. I never finished the conservatory. I, I, I could not really understand how 
people could teach you something so you can teach anything to yourself, basically. You know, and you know, it's not that I don't believe in teachers, but I do believe in teaching myself and learning things on my own. And then you get inspiration from somebody else and blah, blah, blah. So all that to say that uh, I was, uh, I was really keen on, you know, learning. And I went used to California. I, I, I moved to California and my friend Jim gave me one of his LPs of all time music. And he goes, good luck how to become a fiddler. You know, because I was playing the tunes with vibrato and, you know, and all that thing. So he goes, well, no, no, my friends, told me a lot of things about music. My friend, Jim, Peter, Phil, all my good old friends who are, you know, just the, you know, the great, greatest people, you know, and they, they show me something different. And I used to go on sessions. I didn't have much to do, you know. And so they showed me the simplicity of, and that was a long time. And that was probably, I was 22, 23, yeah. And so when, I mean, um, for most people um, who follow a different path in music, so for those who do stay in schools, the ones who do go to conservatoires or universities and stay there and find um, that path meaningful for them, inevitably they will get homework at some point or an assignment or, or some project which uh, encourages them to compose their own music. And yeah. this experience shows me that classical musicians are often in awe of writing their own composing, uh, their own compositions, as I should say. Um, a little bit like, um, I'm not sure if I'm quoting the Beatles when I say that they suggested that everything that has been written or everything that has been sung has been sung before. In other words, everything that you could possibly think of composing uh, already exists. Now, obviously, a composer is not going to agree with that. But a classical musician trained from an early age to to read music and to interpret music by these gods of, of music history um, is often shy of even attempting anything. So they might even know how to. They might have received the tools to compose. Yeah. They've got the solfege, they've got the theory, the counterpoint, all of this stuff. They've got the historical context. And yet sitting down with this blank piece of paper is already the very first step into a kind of a writer's block. <laughs> um, and OK, then we take away that white sheet and we go to just improvise. And then most classical musicians freeze even more. It's improvise? Really? Because that's not what they've been taught. How could you give an offer any idea how we could break through that sort of invisible shield? of respect that most classical mu musicians have because i think honestly that when i listen to your mozart cadenzas um i'm hugely inspired it makes me want to get up and dance it makes me want to share it with everyone it makes me want to go home and try it myself oh that's so cool it makes me feel good you know hearing you say that you know well, it's, i think yes. i speak for many people who really feel inspired and it's like a break from the normal so it's like something mm. for the brain to get excited by because it's not the usual thing and in the context of today younger audiences mightn't see what kind of a huge step of courage that was particularly in the context of something 25 years back in the context yeah, of TV yeah. was a thing and being on tv was a thing and having a fully fledged documentary made about you is still today a massive compliment it's i mean the best publicated publicity you could dream of um you have all of this in you you carry it with you what could you advise a musician now to do to begin exploring and experimenting, to get over the fear, to leave the fear behind and just go for it. Yeah, that's that's basically what it is, fear. Uh, not fear or insecurities, uh, or getting out of your, what they call comfort zone. And, and this is not, everybody's, I, I, you know, because I've been on the road long enough and I'm, you know, reaching, in the 60s and and so I, I'm starting having a little experience talking to kids or not kids or whatever young adults okay um, and every it's always the same thing you you have people who are naturally gifted 
they will have this capacity to do it, but they don't allow themselves to do it because it's not in their personality. But if they go home, if this person, for example, go home and she's really feeling uncomfortable, happy to be alive and, and share the, the gift of music and knowing that we are so lucky to be musician. Well, not probably right now as, you know, whatever time is a little different, way different, but everybody knows and they should know that we are the luckiest people to do music for a living, right? Okay, and then if this first person is like, oh my God, it, it doesn't, why? I mean, why? I'm not able to, oh, okay, fear, insecurities. You, we all know that, right? But if these people ended up being the same way I was, like, I'm not really, I was not really an improviser or anything, you know, I was just this poor guy, you know, just playing tunes with my friends, you know. And we, everybody goes home, feels comfortable and try things out. You might not try, it might not work the first day. Not the second day, not the third day. She's gonna forget about it for like a week, a month, even a year. And then one day out of little, you know, like three seconds of this happiness going, she's got boom, three, three seconds of happiness just creating something. Oh, well, why not? Okay, let's write it down, let's record it. Let's do that. Let's do this. Let, let's see what I can do next. What, what's going on? What's, you know, there's so many little ways of doing it. First thing, you know, of course, you know, the people won't call it egos. No, it's not egos. It's, it's, just, it's, just, it's just insecurities and fear. And once you get it on paper and once you're really, but in another way, Gwendolyn, it doesn't really matter. You know, somebody could, write a little calendar for you and it will be fine too. You see what I mean? Like there is no absolutely need to do that shit because <laughs> I put my shit into it and I go, I'm so glad it's over with. Mm. Oh my God. And people go, oh, like she said, oh, she'll thank you. I said, okay, well, I'm glad <laughs> I did something that could help people a little bit, but it makes people realize that I, all the musicians have to do that? No. Some people don't have to do it. And some people feel like they could do it. Thank you. Some people would call somebody else to do it for them. Yeah, sure. Right? I think what I hear you saying is that it would be hugely helpful also if, if musicians and artists indeed allow themselves to be inspired by all forms of music and art much like the Renaissance man, you know, because having a, an ear for other kinds of music helps you to be more inspired all the time. One of the students who you taught, uh, Roberts, um, who played the Isai from you, he's from Latvia, he has a question for you. And I'd love yeah. to be here on this call. I'd love Roberts to, oh, there he is. Hi, good evening. Hello. Oh, Roberts, I can't see you. Good to see you. I mean, good to hear you. I can't see you. On oh, I'm, I'm, I am here. You should see oh, me now. Good. All right. All right. Great, Maybe great to have see you. Beautiful ears. Ah, thank you. <laughs> They're very new. <laughs> oh, I'm loving the stories. It's incredible. I, I would I would never have imagined that it was uh, such a suffering for you to do that. Yeah. The dance, because it's, it's, it's very bittersweet, perhaps. Well hidden. <laughs> but um, yeah. I wanted to ask you, uh, since you've done so many crazy things in your life musically, um, what what is the single wildest performance you've done or sort of collaboration that you've got together that was, you know, mind blowing or insane for you? Uh, oof, there, I don't think there is one specific one, you know, cause there is always one, one always something that comes out of, 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 of experience with people, you know, playing music. Sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes it's a conflict of per personality. Sometimes it's fear. Sometimes it's, and, and, and like I, I was, you know, out of all these collaborations, I don't think there is one that I particularly like because all of them have something good. Yes. You know, 
I, I don't believe in a special one that changed my mind. No, because it's just sometimes you will have like a really good one and there is a part where you go, oh my God, that was so bad. And, you know, sorry. Yeah. It's, I don't believe in, in one specific time, but they're all a gift, you know, and I'm not really good at it. You know, like, you know, I learn things under pressure. You know, I, I don't study jazz much, so I listen to a lot. Um, but and then and then Mr. Grappelli, you know, Stefan was like almost like grandfather. So I get all this inspiration, inspiration in my life. But then you have so much music to learn and so much music to do and so many friends to see and so many waves to catch. <laughs> and, and, then, and, then, and so, you know, it's just you get it. It's like phases. So uh, experiences with people, I would say, always have something good to say. Always something positive about that. Even if it was negative, it was positive. Because you know well, next time how you're going to work, right? So that teaches you a lesson again. And then if you have this little cloud going, oh, my God. You're playing with a dancer. You go, oh, she's beautiful. Oh, look at the way she dances. And okay, I mean, that's going to make me play better or anything goes man like oh, you right. play beautifully you play beautifully and and i feel like you you know you're a thinker and you get a good heart and you play the violin like you know like all these you know all, all you guys yesterday were so so much fun to teach because you love what you're doing simply you know, thank, right? you, thank you it's it, you're very yeah. your enthusiasm is also very infectious it's oh, it's uh, it comes right. across even on Zoom, which is I think very unusual. And is it things really? can okay. things can be very stale. And yeah, it's really refreshing. It's oh, good! Been well, such a pleasure to meet you, know, you. Yeah, because it's it's a good time of life for me. You know, just right now, I'm just switching gears. You know, it's funny, Robert. I I just go surf every day. Like I was in the ocean this morning at seven o'clock, man. And it was like foggy, no big waves, a long board kind of a thing. And I go go home, I take my shower outside, so I feel good. You know, physically I'm like full of energy and and I dig my trails and I walk barefoot and I play my fiddle and I take a little tape recorder and I go in my and I learn music. So I've been home for like four months, you know? And before that I was like in Korea, you know, when the coronavirus Whoa. started. And then are you Korea, are you patient so, zero? Huh? Are you patient zero? <laughs> well, I do have a lot of patience, yeah. Oh. But but <laughs> oh no, I'm patient. It's coronavirus patient. one. Yeah, no, no, no. Oh my god, I I probably cut it, you know. Because if you, I was in Korea, right? I was in Korea, and then like I got it, and then I go home. I saw my girlfriend for the last time. And then I went to Milano. Hello. <laughs> Milano. Uh, okay. Corona World Tour. Rock. You're down, man. You're going back. And then I go back to Stockholm, give them. And then 8th of March. And the, the dummy fucking Trump closed the airport on the 8th of March, right? Since then, I've been home. And it's like, oh, God. Yeah, so much. So that's why, uh, you know, I was so glad to see you guys yesterday. I was a little nervous because I haven't uh, been like talking about violin and stuff for a long time. So it was it was brilliant. It was so helpful. Oh, it's OK. It's all right. It's all music, you know. Mm. Gee, yeah. Thank you so much for joining us throughout this whole week. We're going to be speaking with you again on Friday. We're going to have a panel right. discussion with you together with Kim Kashkashian and Gary Hoffman. Oh, um, Friday. Uh, okay, cool. Right. And we're going to try and think of some nice topics to discuss. Finn and I will cook up something nice. And I'd like to thank you for sharing this really intimate story and for sharing your beautiful music. Um, I think for myself, what I recognize that I've missed most during this uh, Corona period is um, making music with other people and hearing live music. 
Um, and I understand that through Zoom, it's not quite live music, but it was done in the moment and you played for us. And I'm very thankful to you. Um, it was so beautiful to hear your sound, even through Zoom, you sound fabulous. So, oh, good. Okay. So oh, that seems great. And thank you to you because you're beautiful and you're a mommy and you just had a kid and it's just like going through a lot. <laughs> and you still had the energy with your friend to organize all that. So thank you to you. Wonderful, Jill. Thank you. See you very right. soon. And thank you for spending your time with us this evening and for you yeah. every morning. Stay safe and be well. Thank you oh, yeah. to everybody who's been watching and for all the people who care about music and who continue to support music and education like all those at the National Concert Hall. Thank you, Gilles. Take care. Good night. Stay safe. Ciao.